Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I am so glad that you're here with us. I'm your host, Mira Rubin, and I'm really delighted to introduce our guest, Kate O'Flaherty. Two years ago, Kate founded Solutions Voyage, a nonprofit organization that builds community around local sustainability solutions in Boulder, Colorado. And Solution, Solutions Voyage creates educational spaces at fun events like music festivals and it, it, to empower people through DIY, permaculture education and building community connection. And Kate is actively engineering her sustainable lifestyle by, in one way that she's doing that is by building a tiny home school bus and she's exclusively using local and recycled materials. So Kate, there's all kinds of things you have to share with us. I'm so excited to have you, welcome. Thanks Mira, thanks for having me. Oh, it's, it's gonna be a blast. <laughs> so Kate, just to start off because people might not know what DIY is, especially in the permaculture world, can you give us some background? DIY stands for do-it-yourself, and there's all sorts of different projects that you can embark on to um, live a more sustainable lifestyle, and um, something might be like in creating a worm farm for your kitchen or installing a rain barrel to capture the rainwater off of your roof that feeds your garden or getting some backyard chickens. So uh, we bring educators who talk about projects like that and teach people how to create these things in their own lives. So I have to go back to the worm farm in your kitchen <laughs> because I don't, I don't know that that's um, something that most people would be acclimated to. Can you give us some more background on worm farms? Yeah, they're really simple. You basically can get a bin, a plastic bin, and drill holes in the bottom and then put another bin underneath to capture um, extra moisture and then you get red wiggler worms and put um, you just start off with like a little handful of them in the corner and feed them your kitchen scraps about every other day and you have them covered with shredded newspaper and with the lid on and they build soil for you I think they eat like two times their body weight all, every day um, so they're pretty incredible soil builders and um, and it's pretty easy and you can just have it in your kitchen and then you can feed your garden and, and grow crops from that. So what about, I have to ask, what about the smell? Usually if you're doing it right, there's no smell. If really? Yeah, if you're overfeeding them, um, you might start to get mold and, and that would smell, or if the food is rotting, that would smell. But um, you kind of just see how many worms you have and, and over, you know, a week or a couple weeks, you can kind of gauge how much to be feeding them at a time. So, yep. And then you leave shredded newspaper over the top and there should be no smell. Wow. Although you can have projects that go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> my first worm farm I had in my closet when I was in college <laughs> and um, I neglected them for about a week. And at that point they were just breeding and breeding and they overpopulated and I didn't feed them for two days and I came back and it was like a stinky mess and there were tons of flies. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> that was going to be the other question. What about bugs? Um, fruit flies will come if, if your worms aren't eating their food fast enough or if you do something like I did and neglect it for a little bit too long at just the right moment. But 
generally they do a pretty good job of self-regulating and and eating all the food if you're feeding them in the right uh, proportion. And so how long does it take to convert food to soil? Um, for worms, it doesn't take long at all. And you can, you can kind of see where the worm castings are left behind and it's like a rich black soil. Um, and if you, if you end up being really successful with it, you can start stacking bins and the worms will uh, crawl upward to eat over time. So they'll just leave the rich black soil at the bottom and you can kind of uh, take the soil from the bottom and then restack that bin on top. So, wow. yeah, you can create a whole worm um, complex if you want. <laughs> do, you have, do you have any videos or written material about that that we could make available to people on the sustainabilitynow.global website on the podcast page? Yeah, I could dig something up, definitely. That, that would be great. That would be yeah. great. So that's a nice way to be able to get rid of waste. I, I understand that as far as food waste goes, that there are many, many costs associated with it that are way beyond the loss or waste of the food itself, transporting it, getting rid of it. Um, uh, it it's a big labor and financial intensive sort of endeavor. So mm -hmm. composting is a really important thing that we can do to lower our footprint, right? Yeah, definitely. I'm a huge proponent of composting. And a couple years before I started Solutions Voyage, I ran a small organization called Netherland Compost, which was a community composting facility based out of Netherland, Colorado. And we, um, we had about 60, 70 customers, and we would bike around town and collect people's food scraps, kitchen waste, uh, in five gallon buckets. And then we would compost it all in this facility um, with a couple big earth tubs, they were called, which is, um, they're like two cubic yard composting units from a company in Vermont. But it was um, it was very labor intensive, and there wasn't a lot of money in the composting business, but it really was enriching in terms of being able to see all of that waste being converted into soil to build our community's soil bank. And so it was fulfilling for a good amount of time. And I could definitely envision um, people working together to create more small scale composting operations like that where you know it's on a community level and everyone kind of just pools their scraps together and someone is the steward of the compost pile and and watches over it and turns it and then everybody has um, soil to use that's a, a wonderful thing to augment community gardens absolutely yeah for sure so kate really solutions voyage is very much about education right mm -hmm. that's your primary uh, directive? It's about education and it's about bringing together the community for support and for networking. And it's also about community resilience. So they found that um, there were some studies that were done in Japan about resilient communities during tsunamis. Um, and they found that the communities that had the most money weren't necessarily the most resilient communities, but the communities where people knew each other, where neighbors talked to each other, where there were friends and social networks that were strong, there were less um, deaths, or actually, I think there were no deaths in the communities that were really well socially networked. So we, we bring people together to create that social fabric. Um, and to allow new innovations to happen because there's education involved and, and creativity. And we just create a space where people feel comfortable sharing and being inspired around sustainability. How did you come up with this concept? Um, it, I was largely inspired by a festival that I went to in Oregon called the Oregon Country Fair. And there they have a space that's pretty similar um, where they were demonstrating off-grid solar, how to grow mushrooms, they had a little seed bank. And I was just thinking that it was so necessary to bring something like that to where, to the festivals and events that were in Colorado where I live. And, um, and so that was 
kind of what propelled the mission. And then it's just sort of evolved from there based on the different communities that have requested um, us coming and, and collaborating and bringing spaces and, and organizing educational programming. So you said us, who else is part of your team? Uh, right now, my biggest collaborator's name is Alex, and she is a student at CU. She's the manager of Solutions Voyage right now. And uh, it's always been a small team of community organizers, but when we bring an event together, um, there's many, many people who are involved. So we've got uh, a list of programs for the summer, and we're collaborating with dozens of people. Um, but yep, she's my main organizing assistant at this moment. How do you source the other people or organizations that you're going to collaborate with to set up these events? And what kinds of organizations do you look for? Um, it, it's really topics that are relevant, uh, new appropriate technology, and then people who are kind of like on the forefront of bringing a new industry into, into this culture and community. And so we look for those people and, um, and try to create relationships where it benefits them to be sharing what they're doing and it'll benefit the community that it's serving. So what kinds of things would you say are on the forefront, the, the most exciting things that you're engaging with these days or things that you could share with our listeners that might be new information, up and coming stuff? Well, right now in Colorado, I'm really excited about the hemp industry. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of growth in, in that industry for medicine, for insulation, fiber, uh, food. And there's, it's been growing quite a bit, um, both hemp farming and on the manufacturing side. So we've been connecting with Evo Hemp, who makes hemp bars and hemp food and just started making CBD products. And we're going to be opening a, a store with them where we sell hemp stuff. It's going to be called the Hemp Store. And where we also offer different sorts of ecological solutions and demos. Um, now, so, you said this store that you're opening, it's a pop-up store that you're going to have for six months, you said, yes? Mm -hmm. So tell a, us more about that. That's pretty exciting. It's an old gas station spot that's right in the middle of downtown Boulder. And it's been vacant for a while. And I'm just so excited to take over the spot because, um, or to move into the spot and to, to get people engaged there because it's an industry that we're sort of trying to shift away from fossil fuels and moving into more regenerative culture and renewable resources. And so right next door to the hemp store is going to be um, the uh, farm stand collective. And so we're, we're partnering with farmers and taking all kinds of vegetable waste. So seconds, things that might not present so well at at the bigger stores or at the farmer's market, or maybe they just have a surplus of cabbage and need to get rid of a pallet of cabbage. Um, this farm stand will, will create the opportunity for local farmers to come drop off their excess produce and other people in the community will be pickling it or fermenting it and, um, and just selling it as is, but it's just creates another space for community to network around um, local farming and food. So what kind of growth have you seen in this community? Because you're, you're local in Boulder, so you're, you've been doing this for two years. What have you seen in terms of the evolution of community as a result of what you've been up to? Well, it's hard for me to go anywhere without recognizing someone. <laughs> I'll bet. Um, which feels, you know, it's, it's hard to be anonymous, but it also feels really good and supportive to see so many familiar faces and know that so many people care and are getting engaged doing their own, whatever they're doing. <laughs> but um, yeah, and there's always, you know, the opportunity to connect with people on a deeper level or about different things. And so it's been, it's felt like it's a movement that so many people in Boulder support, of course, 
Boulder can be sort of like a bubble sometimes, but I think um, I've also seen the effects of what we're doing rippling out into other communities as well. Do you have any kind of program whereby you can support other people that would be interested in creating something like what you're up to in their own communities? I've been thinking about that. And right now we don't have any sort of like organizing documents, but that's something that I would like to get together. And I'm, I know of a few resources that can help me pull that together for other people as well, because I would like to see that really it's about all of these small communities creating their own networks and, um, and just cultivating deeper relationships where, where everyone is. And you've really suffered through the growing pains of it and, and I'm sure have encountered and overcome so many obstacles along the way. We always ask people in your journey, what kinds of obstacles have you encountered and how have you overcome how have you overcome them mhm mm well it seems like every different event there's a different thing that comes up um some of the events that we've done some of the events that i've done have been thousands and thousands of people um the biggest well this last summer i went to burning man and worked it wasn't necessarily through Solutions Voyage, although it was related. Um, I worked on the Zero Waste crew at Burning Man, and that was quite a trying journey where I I lost so many resources and I just felt physically exhausted. And, and I think the biggest challenge in this line of work is really not learning how to moderate your energy and not burn out because a lot of times you're in service of um, of the earth and of humanity. And it's, you know, you can zoom out and see that. But then when you zoom in, you're like, oh, I, I'm i just working myself to the bone. And I, I don't have any time or money or anything. But um, just maintaining that vision and, and hope and um, and pulling through on every different event is really gratifying. I'll bet. Yep. So one of the big things that you focus on is permaculture, correct? Mm hmm So you and I had some conversations. I'd love to share with our listeners what, what some of the permaculture's, uh, permaculture principles are and how they can be applied not only to uh, maintaining the earth directly, and our resources, but into social environments as well as business, because we have a lot of social entrepreneurs that are part of our audience. Yeah, well, permaculture is a different thing to every person who will define it. You'll learn that. Um, so for me, permaculture is a lens to, um, to view any sort of social or environmental challenge and for me personally, it's also trying to um, use that lens to guide how I can live more in integrity with what my values are and cultivate healthier interdependent relationships and, and a strong network of supportive people. And then it's also a lot about um, healing both our environment and healing some of our social traumas. Um, so... There's 12, there's, um, there's 12 permaculture principles, and do you want to touch on all of them? Well, you know what, I think, I think maybe we can just pull a couple out to highlight and maybe look at how it applies to the land and social structure and business. Can sure. we do that? Yeah. So, so how, about, how about if we talk about use edges? and value the marginal? So um, using the edges and valuing the marginal is, um, you can approach it and look at it from sort of like a landscaping perspective um, and how nature works. For example, where the trees in the forest meet the edge of the prairie, is uh, where there's a lot of different population dynamics at play. There's both the grasses and those um, ecologies and the trees. 
and um, and the forest ecology and those two environments are meeting each other and it's in those spaces where a lot of the action happens like uh, the hawks will be hunting for the mice there and um, mountain lions might hang out on the edge of the forest looking for deer and also in a garden it's where um, those edges where different plants meet are where they interact and there's there's just a greater variance for change and then from a social perspective um, using the edges and valuing the marginal could mean uh, thinking about where two neighborhoods meet and and how in that space there's a lot of potential for for something to happen and it's really up to the people who are engaged the stakeholders but um, you you can think about it in terms of that or um, thinking about valuing marginal populations so people who maybe don't always have access to healthy food or have um, access to these conversations and, and getting different people involved and in valuing populations that aren't always at the table. So we're looking at those edges really as points of opportunity and dynamics, yes? Mm-hmm, exactly. And even from a personal standpoint, thinking about going to your edge of uncomfortability and moving beyond that. Exactly. Um, yep. That's where growth happens, yep. right? Mm-hmm. For sure. Uh, how about, uh, there's another one here that says, use small and slow solutions. Especially, I, I was interested especially in that because so much of our culture is about faster, more, better, bigger, and use small and slow solutions is very counterculture, I think, on the surface. And I'd love to hear how that applies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think when people in general recognize that um, the way that we're living is, as a society, as a culture, is counter to maybe our personal beliefs about what we should be doing, it can seem really overwhelming and can seem like um, you have to change everything at once in order to be living the life that you believe that you should be living, um, to not, you know, recognizing that each action that we're taking has an impact. But it makes sense and it's more realistic to just think about all the little things that you can do. For example, maybe you can bring your own bag to the grocery store or use a recycled water bottle, a recycled water bottle, um, or have a worm farm in your kitchen and just taking those little baby steps is is what you can do in your daily life to really make a change and if if a large amount of people do those little things it really does create difference and and that's how we change culture it doesn't all happen at once it's it's slowly slowly integrating all of those lessons and new practices into our daily lives i'm wondering if you so might that's what it means to me yeah, that's wonderful. I'm wondering if you might be able to compile a list or identify a list of simple things like that, that people can do that will sure. incrementally move them toward greater sustainability. Would, would you be able to do that? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. Very cool. So I want to go, at, you're kind of a visionary, Kate. That's what I see. And one of the things that you said, um, I just want to identify that you said you're working to live within the context and in alignment with your values. And it sounds that it sounds like you have very clearly defined values that you're very conscious of. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think that so many people suffer as a result of not having clarity around their values in life. They end up in circumstances of work or social connection that is has a deep misalignment for them and they're not even aware of where their pain is coming from because they're not connected to 
that that uh, dis discordance. So, have you always mm -hmm. been a person who's been clear on your values and in alignment with them? I would say I've been clear on my values. Um, my parents raised me in a way where they were always encouraging connection with nature and and family and friends and um, and I've always had the awareness that I care generally about the planet, but then I grew up in kind of a mainstream sort of situation. Um, and so for me, it's been slowly learning how to alter my lifestyle to, um, to really recognize the impacts of all the choices that I'm making and try to make the best choices that I'm capable of. And so it's been a slow process. Well, you yeah, may. and right. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say a big thing that I've recognized is um, just learning to take responsibility also for my actions and and for the choices that I'm making, and you know, not not making excuses, not placing blame. It's been a because I think it's easy to say, oh, I would do that, but blah 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 blah. So it's been kind of a slow journey. And, um, and one thing that I realized that is kind of inevitable is that to live and exist in, in this culture, um, you have to participate in the capitalist system, which is inherently, well, you don't have to, I should say, but yeah, we're largely guided into participating in the capitalist system which is kind of a destructive system and doesn't take into account um, the effects of, you know, mining, extracting resources and exploiting labor and, and that sort of thing. And so everything that I can try to do to shift myself away from being reliant on that system by um, using trade in my life and saying, I can offer you this service or product if you can give me this, um, that's been really effective in feeling like um, I am living much more in alignment with what I truly believe. And it really, it brings um, the economy, it brings the local economy much closer and creates like a real uh, tangible sort of feeling of, of a local vibrant um, economic system and social network what what would you say is the one thing that can help people move toward the permaculture life set, lifestyle because it really is not it is a whole lifestyle it's sort of principles for living wouldn't you say mm -hmm. um i would say that thinking about where your food comes from and just thinking about the next time that you plan to go to the grocery store, maybe thinking about whether there are alternatives like going to the farmer's market or planting some kale in your front yard or um, just like seeing those systems and, and deciding where you wanna participate. One of those basic things that's a necessity for everyone, which is why I recommend thinking about that. And it's, it's a global system right now, and um, it's something that we all can be empowered to um, to make a more vibrant local economy by supporting local food systems. Are there any particular resources you you would recommend for folks for permaculture to get a foundation or expand their knowledge around it? I would say Gaia's Garden is a really good one. Um, there's one that's called Sustainable Cities. Okay. Well, you know, what we'll do is we're going to have links on our website for all the resources that you mentioned. And I have to ask you about your tiny home. Yes. Yep. It's been a work in progress and it's been a fun project and very humbling. And I'm learning all sorts of new skills. Um, how to install solar. I've been using reclaimed wood for flooring, um, old flooring that was pulled out of a different house. And I'm milling my own wood 
that's from a wood miller um, up in the mountains to create siding for the, the inside of the space. And it's an old school bus that I'm converting into a, a little tiny home for myself. What, so, what inspired it's that? It's been a fun project. I'll bet it has. What inspired it? Um, well, just thinking about my personally, how I want to live in the world. And um, I love traveling. I got sick of paying rent. <laughs> and I wanted to be able to create my own space and have the freedom to, um, to be where I want to be and, uh, and to be independent and interdependent and really kind of forge my own way. So this has been a really great experiment in, in that. And um, prior to that, I had a bunch of, I usually lived in community, which was also really nice. So now I'm kind of, it's always a trade off, you know, any, any decision that you make, you're choosing that over something else. So I sort of do miss living in community like I did before. I always had a bunch of housemates and we could collaborate on a bunch of projects, but it's also really cool to um, create my own space and think about what, what thriving looks like to me and what sort of space I want to be in. So Kate, if people want to get in yeah. touch with you, how can they reach you? We have a website. Uh, it's called solutionsvoyage.org. And my email address is also solutionsvoyage at gmail.com. Okay. We'll so have either of those ways. We'll Great. We'll have <clears throat> link. Cool. our timing on the video is sort of lapsed. So I don't mean to be talking on top of you, but there's a lag. So I apologize for that. Anyway, that's awesome. Oh, that's we, okay. It gave us all kinds of goodies. And I'm wondering if there's anything that you'd like to conclude with. I just want to thank you for having me and I'm really excited to see the rest of the interviews and uh, connect with this network. That's great. And I hope that, that that's actually one of our intentions is to be broadening the community and, and actually build a movement, a sustainability now. And uh, we hope that you are, you've got your hands in so many wonderful things. I want to put out there that you may be collaborating with us and contributing on our website and uh, we welcome that. And I would love to have our listeners just keep an eye out for good things from you. Maybe you can post some of your progress on your bus and who knows what else. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Cool. Thank and you. how can yeah. we, how and can I, we have, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, we have a new media person and I think she'll be happy to spread the word and share some stuff with you. That would be great. Some updates. Perfect. Cool. Perfect. So last but not least, is there a way that our listeners can support Solutions Voyage? Well, eventually we're going to be um, having another campaign to go on the road and to create events around music and libraries and DIY spaces. And so at that point, we will be fundraising for that. And currently, you can just do, take every action that you can take to improve the life around you. Beautiful. Kate, thank I want to thank you so much for being with us. This was wonderful. And I, I'm excited to have you be a contributing member of Sustainability Now as well, and to be supporting Solutions Voyage in any way that we're able. And I just want to thank our audience for listening and being with us and building the community. They're the ones that are making it happen. And 
that's it for now. I'm your host, Mira Rubin. Until next time, live your best life, love the world around you, and together we can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now, solutions to shape a world that works. Visit sustainabilitynow.global for resources related to today's program. And be sure to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.